not to the fact that they're just outboard of the shoreline. Well, and that's a clear distinction, right? And that's usually what we see outboard of the shoreline. These timber um, um, uh, crib structures, these riprap structures are usually d distinct um, uh, elements. It's not like the whole, they filled outboard all with boulders. Right. It's usually related sure. to these old crib walls. Right. right. Um, where they, they, they needed the riprap to protect these old structures. But that was something that they encountered and they had to deal with in their construction. Right, but, and, but we think if, you know, again, it, we, we don't, it's not unique to this 100 foot by 100 foot lot, now, one but thing it's certainly, we're, what, we're, what our information, our prior experience shows is that it's at least unique to this area of the block. One thing I was um, curious about was there was a structure previously on the, 21st Street site, I wasn't sure when it was constructed, what year, and what kind of foundation it had. If it had the similar foundation with these timber piles and these, you know, border pile caps, if that was something they encountered, I wasn't sure about that. Sure. It, it seems to me that we should uh, expand on this report um, and go north and south. Um, and get as much information as we can, if we can. Um, in addition to the boulder condition, there's also the building leaning condition. And we, um, I don't know, again, we don't know what the situation was with West 21st Street. I understand the logic of saying, well, if, if that building on the corner is leaning, wouldn't it have leaned into it? Uh, we don't have that information. Um, Another question along those lines is, I'm just curious, you have any survey data to back up your assumption that the three buildings are leaning and moving together. I mean, I understand the theory about there's no gap, but something a little more concrete like, yes, we have a survey of, you know, this, this, this floor level and it's definitely leaving, leaning this way. You know, or windowsills, you know, that we can see from those okay, windowsills. Let's, let's leave it, let's leave it and come back because I think um, we've answered as much as we can uh, today and then we can um, expand on the report. Uh, but, and again, I'm just, I guess I'm repeating myself, but the, even if the other building leaned, or it, it's not, um, we don't see that as conclusive um, in terms of the conditions um, being unique. Well, it's very important because that's your main reason for saying that you cannot demolish this building without extensive costs. Right. So that's why it's important. Okay. So we'll take a we'll take a look at this and um, uh, and this condition. Um, but again, the, you know the the reasonable return is two elements. There's cost and there's income. So there's there's two pieces of it that we'll we'll talk about together in the context of the reasonable return. Right. But but I just have to make the point that if it is found that this is not a unique situation then these costs can't be considered premium costs. They would just be considered ordinary construction costs. And you would have to show us that an ordinary unencumbered site with these ordinary costs could make a return. Fine. We'll do that. We'll do that. OK. OK. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I just wanted to conclude. I think with that data is, is there. We can elaborate on it, uh, you know, make it more clear if, if that's what's necessary. But we do think we have the data to support the, the opinions, the professional opinions that we've come to to date. With respect to the subject of leaning, I mean, we demolish buildings all the time. And there are, there are party wall buildings or buildings right up against each other, right? Is it, is it unusual to find buildings that are leaning against each other? Yes. Yeah, I mean, that's something that, that is a concern in every... Rows of, rows of tenement buildings all built in a row like that, not necessarily with shared party walls? It is, uh, and I, I mean, um, un unless the foundations are compromised, right, why would you expect the building to be leaning? And we do know that our, our found, foundations have settled and are, are degraded, so therefore they're, they're leaning, right? There's, there's a cause and an effect here. Well, and, and most of these other jobs, the you, we go into those buildings and those foundations of those old buildings are in great shape. So even where they're built on fill as opposed to bedrock? Sure. Lower east side, that kind of stuff? Sure. Huh. That hasn't necessarily been my experience. Neither has it been mine. I, I have years of having to go to 
collapses in Brooklyn. Brooklyn, yes. Well, well, there, 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 there are collapses the, that are caused during demolition if well, there are, are conditions that are not during revealed. During demolition, but also because you get significant leaning, especially in row houses that have rubble foundations, where you start to have what you're talking about, sort of that movement, and it all moves at once. And once you decide that you're going to take out one of those pins. Well, right, right, but the, the, the question started with the supposition that just because we have old buildings, we have leaning. And that's not the case. Old, there are old buildings where the foundations have been compromised or degraded. Absolutely. And in those I conditions, sort of as exists at this site. We think we were challenging your premise that it, it was unusual. I'm right. not so sure that it's necessarily unusual. One can find, find it you know, in various places in the city. I'm just saying that it's not unusual. And it's not my, ex in my experience, it's not unusual. But we have both, we have a, a condition where we have this leaning, but the building is in great shape, right? It can be preserved, right? But, but that's um, a different question. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're relying very much for this argument on the fact that the buildings are leaning. Therefore, can't take the building down, right? That, that's what, that's where all this is, is heading towards. And if you could take the building down, then arguably the construction cost would be less because you're not worried about the effect on the neighboring buildings. But I mean, just literally across the street on, on um, Broadway, there was a removal of a building which caused the destabilization of the neighbor. So we see it, in fact, it happens quite a lot in this all neighborhood. All Tribeca. Yeah, all of Tribeca is afflicted by this kind of Right, but, but here we have a sampling. We have a sampling of projects in the area. For the most part, right? We have uh, one, two, three, four um, projects right around the site. And we probably have more where we didn't encounter these conditions, and we were able to demolish the existing buildings and and and, right. and not have this hardship that we're suffering at this site. Okay, so maybe it's a maybe it's a construction difficulty, but it's not a unique condition. Maybe that's what we're talking about. So. So what we're trying to do is figure out how to get to the A finding. We're, we're still having difficulty, right? In part because we have the adjacent property and a lot of soil inf soil study information, and and in part because now we're talking about a leaning building in New York City where buildings lean. So, so we're gonna. I'm gonna sum up where we are and what we need to do on the A finding, mm -hmm. uh, and then we're gonna move on to the B finding because there were a number of questions with that as well. So with the A finding, again, our our position is that we have um, an aggregate of conditions, an aggregate of conditions that all together create a building that doesn't have a feasible return. Those conditions include. Um, the costs uh, involved with construction, the premium costs, um, and we'll talk about encumbered and unencumbered, but it also means that what can we build on the site once we uh, address those. So in that situation, we're, we're, um, we have the um, split lot, and we have the size of our lot, and the, the extent of our lot in each district. And when you put all of those together, and we did our financial work, we did not get a reasonable return. And it's based on those factors that are part of the lot. And it's an aggregate of factors. It's not any one particular factor, and we're not saying that any one particular factor is um, not found at other sites in the city. Okay. So, but. We, o we always look at the premium cost. That's, that's one of the main. Yes. And I, before we get into the financials, the premium cost we look at, and you know, we had a project not too long ago where the premium cost was something like $20 million, right? <coughs> so then you're very sympathetic because it's costing them $20 million to deal with the structural problems on their, on their site. And in this case, we started off with a premium of a million and a half dollars which doesn't get you to the same sympathy. No, but that, right? that number was that number was wrong. But even the new number, I agree, is not twenty million. Right, but and it, it's well for one, not sure that we get to your new number because in fact it's a new number. Um, but let's just say even if it were the new number, it's not very much, and it doesn't get you as much sympathy, right? Right. So but I guess that's <laughs> to compensate for the two and a half million or whatever isn't isn't a big variance if we agreed there was an A finding. Right. So I guess, yeah, and again, I guess I just want to make sure I'm, uh, I'm saying it clearly enough. It's really the aggregate, and it's the premium costs, and it's what you can build to address those premium costs that are limited. Because so. you could just take a site that's in a perfectly good location that's 50 feet wide, and you could say, 
I paid I paid a lot of money for this site because that's a going rate and I can't <coughs> make a reasonable return on a hotel here but that's not a variance application no right? it's not it's not um, because right so you know I, I probably shouldn't have bought the site or the site's <coughs> overvalued even if we even if we're using comps and it can't and this the the market doesn't support the as of right uses that's not a variance right so first we have to get the a finding right. and then the premiums that result from all the burdens that's what gets compensated not just not market conditions obviously residential market is better than say so some I'm kind of commercial I'm, market. I'm, Totally, we totally, agree, <coughs> and we understand. Um, okay. And so we, so we've looked at a whole aggregate of, of conditions, costs, what we can build, um, and not based it on uh, what we paid or what we might have paid or whatever for the site. Um, so let's go to the costs and talk about that because I know there were a lot of questions. On right, and I just Ali wanted Brown. to add to the chair that on the flip side of your conversation, there could be unique conditions that are established that don't necessarily result in a financial hardship. And you could still make more than a reasonable return even having those unique conditions. So it's not just a question of uniqueness and the B finding separate. Uniqueness has to lead to your inability to be equal to your neighbors. It needs something to make you whole and make you whole as even with your neighbors. And so it's, it's a two-step process. You have two thresholds, but you have interrelated thresholds, the A and B. Right, and we, we, we believe that we've demonstrated that is because of those conditions that we have the cost that we have. So that's what we're going to... That, right, that but is if, if you would, you know, I know you were here, you heard my comments, and my comments actually stated the opposite. What I felt was the opposite looking at your information that was given to me so therefore and and combining that with information that was given to the opposition that's fine and then we're going to try to answer those we understand okay so i'm going to call um or ask jack freeman is going to come up next good afternoon this is still the morning session right <laughs> Um, I'm here to try and um, address, hopefully, uh, successfully, some of the questions that came up. The only thing I, I just want to point out here is that we have never said that the issue of leaning is a premium cost. The issue of leaning and supporting the adjacent structures only comes up when you look at an alternative which would demolish the existing building. We have not said that leaning results in any underlying premium costs. So I just no, want but having to keep the built, existing building leads to premium costs because of the, 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 the uh, specialized agreed. drilling equipment, so that it's related. Right, but when, when we were asked to look at a building uh, alternative, which, which would demolish the existing building, it was the conclusion of the engineers, which is what drove the cost, and a number of things would have to take place. If you remove the existing building, you'd have to replace the existing structure's stabilizing influence with a stabilizing structure. So that was part of the course. The other thing that you have to do when you replace the existing building is you have to reproduce basically the volume and construction that's within the existing building. So there's a savings that results from keeping the existing building. But I don't believe that in any of the documents submitted, it was ever said that the leaning issue or the stabilization of the adjacent buildings was a premium cost. The only premium costs that were identified were related to the underlying foundation conditions of the building and how those were being addressed. So I just wanted to, to, to make sure we clarify that we have never said there was a premium cost related to the stabilization of the adjacent properties. So now, in fact, as, uh, as uh, Carol mentioned, uh, there were mistakes made, and they were in two areas. One was there was, an in, there was a uh, change in the construction cost premium estimate, and it rose to about $3.2 million. The result of that was essentially a result of materials increases because the geotechnical engineer and the structural engineer 
identified additional scope of work items that increase the materials cost and the character of addressing those. So it was essentially an $800,000 increase. A co construction cost estimator doesn't do the engineering. In order to do his estimate, what he does is he takes the facts that are provided to him by the technical professionals, the engineers and the architects, and he does an estimate on that basis. So what happened in between was, and that's why we had Muser here, they did additional survey work, the additional scope was identified, and that increased the information provided to the construction cost estimator and resulted in roughly an $800,000 increase in, Sorry, in construction Sorry, wasn't it the third cost. test pit, if I understood correctly, that revealed the uh, um, extra bouldering? It was the third test pit. That was conducted in May of 2015, right? The first hearing here was in September of 2015. Remember, the estimate that was done by the estimator in the first instance was in a report submitted to you in March. And yeah. subsequent to that, no, I, that I was revised by the estimator. So the information... Right, right, right. Okay, I'm just going to interrupt you. The first hearing was in September. New data was discovered over the summer. We go to hearing. We find out before we go to hearing. I mean, you, applicant. Before you go to hearing, you find out new data. You say, wow, opportunity to revise my application to be accurate. And you don't... You choose not to do it. I'm confused. Well, the construction right? cost, I'm not, I'm. Because it, it was many months before that you had the new data. So that's, it's extremely confusing to me why. All right, I'm why. sorry that Bill McCookin was unavailable. But basically, he submitted a letter dated September 24th, which reflected his subsequent discussions with the engineers and the additional facts he had available. And on the basis of that, he did revise his but he revised it after the first hearing, after we reviewed all this data, which was your represent your, the applicant, you and your team's representation of what the situation was. And so I'm, what I'm not understanding is how are we supposed to, how, how would you my, respond to, my, my to, response some, to me there. saying to you that I submitted you all this data, the data is based on all this empirical evidence, we have all of these specialists doing it, and then, oops, we well, had a chance Carol, to correct it when we should have corrected it, but we didn't, and then I, we corrected it. I think Carol it addressed that by saying that mistakes were made, and she asked the team of consultants and professionals to better coordinate, and the result of that better coordination, in response to the questions that came up to the hearing, was better coordination. And it resulted in an $800,000 increase in construction costs. It, it resulted in a, ultimately a $4 million reduction in what we estimated as the acquisition costs. And I think that those are the two areas that were most affected uh, and uh, incorrect in the first submission to the board. So I think Carol's response, I, I just rely on it, which is that on the basis of the questions that came up, she asked the consultants to coordinate better. And it's, you know, you, you're aware that the cost estimator isn't the engineer on the project. Yes, I'm very And aware. subsequent to the work that he did that re resulted in the cost in March, yes, in the summer, they did do some additional uh, test pits and they discovered additional information. It was communicated to the cost estimator so that he could write a letter on September 24th. That ironically came after the major mistake was uncovered about uh, no the one, site. No one's, no one's uh, standing here and saying mistakes weren't made. No, I understand, but you can understand why the board has got a big question mark as to the accuracy I, of these figures because of the timing, the timing of the error and the co timing of the correction of the and the introduction of additional material makes the board go, hmm, what's really and, going and on I, here? I, I, I'm very empathetic to that. I can understand exactly uh, why you would have the question. And I think it was because mistakes were made. And, but, you know, I'm, I believe that we, you know, in the process since then, we've tried to restore the credibility. And the facts are what are driving this at the moment. And they, re they resulted in an $800,000 cost increase of direct cost and a reduction ultimately in the value of acquisition uh, based on 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 review of that of almost and, it, a, and an increase in the price 
of the rights of the development rights also came at the same time so well, i'll speak so to that you, there was a, right okay. but but let's say for the record there was a, a major correction that was needed downward to the site value due to the calculation of the development rights and the max far right it was and an error that that should have corrected downwards much. It was corrected downward and and I'll then it was off, right and then it was offset by the increase in the value TDRs. of the I'll TDRs speak to that as separately. well. No, right. I no, no, I know, but I just wanted to to state the record clearly that I, that it was one massive error and a couple of cleanups in the I, other direction that to it offset. It was an error and a couple of cleanups, and the effect okay. of that was. The, the, the facts were then represented to you. Okay, so we're need, let, let, just to cut to the chase here, yes. we're still not persuaded by the numbers because you make errors at a time. It's supposed to be a complete application, it's supposed to be clean. I don't really get the idea of submitting an application filled with errors to make your argument, and then the board points out your errors, and then you correct the errors, and it, and it skews everything. And so let's just say, we need to we need to work on some other things. So I don't want to spend more time. Yeah, I I, I want on, to answer the, each of the, the questions errors. that came up. So right. Uh, so let's work on like there's other there's other mistakes that I see in the analysis that were done. For instance, um, and I don't know if you want to go through them, but for instance, the lesser variance two or three has a difference of 84 square feet on the built residential. The architect floor is area. here to speak to that. Okay. Well, the architect's going to talk about 84 square feet. That sounds more like the financials well, need to be modified for 84 I mean, square feet. We can take them okay. in order. I'm here to speak about the questions related to the B finding. B finding? And the architect is here to speak about questions related to area and the design and, and what's affected. I, I mean, I can. I think this is a B finding question. It sounds to me like. Right? No, first of all, it is a, it's a B-finding question because what he needs to do or what the applicant needs to do is prove that the as of right cannot work. And so my pushback was that if I went back to September 30th, which is the revised report with the new numbers, and I used some, some information I saw in the opposition report, and I repriced and plugged in different information that as of right residential 19 story, residential and gallery can work. Now, as of your September 30th report, you have a 5.57% overall return on that. And that's with you renting your parking spaces for a minimal amount of money, and it's with about a $2,500 a square foot price for your apartments. I, I'd my, like to speak. Right, so, but, but I wanted to clearly state, so my question is, if you rearrange your source of income, you can make a return that is probably an acceptable return by conduing your parking spaces, which I'm sure you're going to address, and then using condominium sales prices on buildings that are riverfront, like yours is, because I believe that there's somebody whether it's your site or the site directly to the south, has some sort of an agreement with the HP building. Because, we'll, we'll speak to that. <laughs> right, because the HP building, you know, if it were to be able to expand in height, I'm sure that 551 West 21st Street would not have gone right up on the lot line with beautiful lot line window apartments. I, I think I can address each of those questions, okay? First, first off, let, let me start by saying that yes, there was an agreement with the HP building only related to the West 21st Street property, which only gives them a light and airy, only allows them to have uh, windows that permit habitable rooms on the other side. They are not considered lot line windows. We, or our property, does not benefit, as the buildings department sees it, from the agreement between the West 21st Street property and the HP building. We cannot not have lot right you cannot have lot line windows but the windows you do have, have view. give you a benefit because it gives you an unobstructed river view but and that's got to be reflected in your sales I, price I per square foot we we I, i'm going to stand behind what we provided <coughs> right so then i'm going to present you with the information that supports that 
Right, and I'm saying that a lot of the, the sites that you used as comparables were east of this site. We used along this, the High Line, and I would argue, right, but I would argue that that your riverfront buildings, your tower riverfront buildings, so I'm not talking about the building that is the, um, is it the Jacques Nouveau or whatever, the building that's two mm. blocks south. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about your two towers because the towers behave most like your building is going to behave. And so that would be 211th <coughs> Avenue as well as 551 plus 21st, who have average sales prices per square foot going up as high as $4,000 a square foot. Uh, you're at $2,500 a square foot, possibly because you're using a lot of sites that are in board of your site to the east. And I don't believe that Highline views are as valuable as river views. So I think that you need to do some adjusting. There. Well, we'll, we'll take a look at that. But I want to just make the point that the highest price on the West 21st Street building are incredible penthouse apartments with private swimming pools with a tremendous amenity package right I cannot take you a, have to show us that and you, i'll be glad to you do have that. to go through that opposition's listings and distinguish yourself from them if you're not going to use those I, I, i'm just going to say for now because we, we, yes. we can't go through it but no no in a submission of course has a has a tremendous amenity package which differentiates as 270 degree legal windows looking out on on the river it has parking uh, available on site it has a set of building services that cannot be provided so i, I will right show true, you but how you, we you have parking on site you have 360 degree it has views. 50 parking spaces not you know not it's a much larger 15. building than your building. you well, have 13 floors one apartment too. each basically okay i will make the adjustments i i do, do try to address all your questions so i mean that's that's my job and then let's see where the return goes without changing anything else on the cost side okay, let's see where the return ends up and then we could talk about whether or not you have a uniqueness finding that results in your building not being able to make a reasonable well, return we, we we think that that we do i mean it's there's not a it's not to my mind uh, with all due respect madam chair a sympathy question we have a three three million dollar or so cost difference and all we've asked for is a variance based on our analysis and, and we'll, we'll take a look at your question it only eliminates the cost of that variance in other words if we did not have that encumbrance that results in three million dollars in in costs we would have a feasible project. But you, you have to show it to me because what I just well, laid I, out I, I in a very that. coarse way suggests something okay. different. I, I, I will do that. So I wanted to just go over each, each of the questions that you had. So uh, regarding the value of the transfer, the change in the value there when we initially did the work in March, we did not have available any actual high line development rights transfer. So we used the same methodology to value the development rights that we would use on other properties. Which I, is I'm in, accepting your $700 a square okay, foot. Okay, good. I'm so, so we can that. move on. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's how we got there. We had actuals as opposed to uh, estimates. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, the, another question came up uh, on several occasions. Why not include grocery store food? related things that at, for our 7,000 square feet of space. Uh, we said in part of our response that we have used high-end uh, comps for retail space and we have not presumed it would be gallery. There's nothing that prevents it from being used for any other retail space that wants to pay $130 a foot. Uh, the that, question, that wasn't my question. So. This was the chance yeah, question. Exactly. Okay, but I mean, I'm going through the <laughs> list. It does affect the economics. Uh, we looked at the Gansevoort market. The Gansevoort market is not a retail space, okay? It's a food hall. Food halls are run by an operator. The operator uh, organizes it and pays rent to the owner of the property and then runs the, the food hall. And uh, Gansevoort Mart, I mean, I. Just, just so you understand, I, I just completed uh, a uh, analysis unrelated to the Board of Standards of Appeals for a major uh, food hall venue uh, in Hudson Yards. So I'm pretty familiar with 
how uh, food hall venues work. Uh, and uh, basically, there's an operator. He pays rent to the owner. He then runs the place. The, the um, tenants who do the little food stands where you buy your ice cream or your pizza or your coffee, <coughs> they pay, uh, on, on the average, uh, somewhere around $7,000 a month to the operator. If we ran the numbers on, on that for the Gansevoort market, the Gansevoort rent from those tenants is about $210 a foot. However, that rent doesn't <coughs> flow to the, the owner of the property. It goes to the operator of the, of the food hall and he pays uh, the owner uh, whatever rent they negotiate. The Gansevoort is a, in the middle of a very high traffic area and all people who do uh, and, and develop food hall venues work on the basis of, and the question we get asked on the studies that we do is, what's the footfall? What's the foot traffic? The, the, the Gansport market is on the one street that goes from the beginning of the High Line to the Whitney Museum. It's a very high traffic street. And even with that, uh, we believe that the underlying rent paid to the owner of the Gansport is about the same $130 or less than what we're getting. Because the little guys who do those spaces are small, they pay a, a tremendous amount of rent, but it doesn't flow to the owner. And the owner of a building can't develop that. It needs an operator. To okay, do that. but he still gets rent, right? Well, but what we're saying, we, we have $130 of rent. Okay. Foot rent. And we're not restricted in terms of what we can use that for. If an operator comes in and says, I'll pay you $130 a foot, I don't think the developer is going to turn that away. If a market comes in and says $130, okay, we're not wed or married to a cow. It's $130 a foot, which we feel is supported by the comps that we did. It's quite high. If you look at some of them, and we did it in our response, for example, uh, in the West 50s in a comparable location relative, uh, there's a, a, a similar size space is going for $60 a foot. And even on an area like Third Avenue, it's only going for 200. So when you look at the comps we did, we think they're they're fine, and we think 130 dollars a foot is actually a high rent. And we're not married to a gallery there. It's whoever wants to pay 130 dollars for 7,000 square feet of space. So what about the comps that were provided, or let's say the information that was provided um, about the sale of gallery space? About the sale, I don't think that it's it's necessarily. Uh, this is a rental space. This is a rental provides the owner of a property, and that's part of the question with parking as well. With long-term revenue that grows over time, the equity that's kept in the project increases as the rents go up at a differential rate to the operating expenses, and that's what rental real estate is about. Not everybody does condominiums. So the question of a sale of a condominium, I mean, we sale of the space, I mean, we looked at reasonable comps and we think that the owner of this property would develop it as rental because the rental has, it's a different business model. And to say that he should do it as a condominium, I, I'm not sure what the benefit would be to him in doing that as opposed to having long-term income well, because, at 130 bucks a foot. Right, but because we're only looking at the initial years of, of income stream and we're trying to maximize that to see whether or not you require a variance or some waivers, it's why we're asking you to no, I, I, I look into conduing the entire building in one way, shape, or form. But, but that would be the question you would ask of any rental project. The difficulty, I think, is that when somebody looks at, and you're, you know that, if someone is looking at a project, he's not looking at it as a snapshot the way a performer does. In fact, he would be looking at what the increase in income over a period of time weighed against the increases of, of uh, operating expenses, and then what ultimately after a 10 or 15 year period right, of time. Right, before the amount of space that that parking takes up in the building, it's quite a low amount. Of, it seems like it's a low amount of annual income well, I, that's I, been I'm, afforded I'm talking that. about the retail now, and I think yeah. that using, the, considering right. the retail to be rental retail is an appropriate way to look at that. And that's the way we, we've done it in many projects. I don't think uh, looking at it as a condominium, because the opposition thinks we should look at it as a 
condominium is necessarily appropriately <coughs> the way to look at no, it. No, it's not that they think we should. They gave us comps on a variety of retail space. Well, they didn't give you comps. Then. I'll well, address they gave us the opposition. Addresses. They gave us a list of us retail addresses. listings, and they did not draw any relationship yes, right, 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 between right. our property and that. And then right, right. They, they they're not adjusted, and they're not comparables. Right. I mean, it's very, uh, that's we're going to provide the Commissioner Otley Brown with adjustments that look at uh, their list and, and, and draw a relationship between our property and the list. But a list is not a comparable, and, it, and unless it's adjusted, it's not really something that you can... Right, but when, when you do make your adjustments, please support them with we'll do. photos, floor plans, and we will do things that. that are objective we'll, to we'll do that. your point. Okay, so, um, I mean, I think that answered the questions related to retail, and uh, we did respond in writing regarding the opposition's uh, presentation. Uh, the question was raised, why not have full floor units uh, on more floors? Why not increase the number of bedrooms? I will provide it as documentation, but basically the fourth quarter report from Corcoran uh, indicates that people aren't buying three-bedroom apartments. The, the the sales price of, uh, and I'll just quote but, from their but report. But the super luxury market. The super luxury market has gone down between the third quarter and the fourth but quarter, according to Corcoran. And what Corcoran says, studios and three-bedroom residences had increased days on the market. In other words, they're not selling as quickly. In another place in their fourth quarter report, they note that the in the luxury market, that the average the median price, I'm sorry, of, of luxury apartments has gone down 11% between the third and fourth quarter, and 6% in, in, in the average price between the third and the fourth quarter. I'm just, th this is the corporate report. And then the other thing that they note in the report is a 9% drop in the median price on three-bedroom apartments will be between the third and the fourth quarter. So. Um, I know that there are several projects that uh, where larger units were originally established, they're being subdivided. And they're being subdivided because the three bedroom apartments are just not selling. Right now, uh, uh, believe it or not, the market for residential has flattened. In fact, it's going down and developers who have very large apartments that are not selling are subdividing those to make apartments that are more marketable. And th these are in really high end. <coughs> So I'll, I'll address that further in writing and provide this. But uh, two-bedroom apartments are great. And three-bedroom apartments are not doing as well as they were doing in the last quarter. And uh, I'm just looking at, at Corcoran, because they do an aggregate of the market. And I looked at it both in terms of their downtown and in terms of their luxury market. So uh, markets are volatile. Basically. Please submit that. I will do that. Uh, all right, so that why not increase the number of bedrooms? It's not necessarily the prudent thing to do when the market is flat and going down and when three bedroom apartments are, are not selling. It. And you know, However, 432 Park one, Avenue. Yes, but one could push back that if you're increasing the number of bedrooms, just like in the ads of right, you have one apartment per floor. You have one apartment per floor in your lesser variances. If we get to E, I would argue would be a more lucrative well, venture we, because you can spread your prime price per square foot across the entire floor we, instead we, of splitting heard, it into. We heard that comment at the review session and, and that's what led me to take a look and see what in fact is happening. I'm not sure that the value of one apartment per floor is, is going to be greater than two apartments per floor in the market. Uh, I, you know, it's not. Uh, build it and they will come. In a sense, it's it's what the market is. It seems to be buy. like that on the river. Hmm? It seems to be build it and they will come uh, all along the river. Um, There's a lot of that. Okay. <laughs> well, people who are bu building some in luxury areas, 432 Park Avenue, 4 Sullivan Street, they are now taking their three bedroom apartments and. That's not the river. Well, Park Avenue is a good address. Yes, it's a nice address, but. But the river is, what's going on on the river, I want to see you pull that together for me to prove your point. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm going to address that, but I, I felt it was important to note that large apartments are not necessary. You know, you might be right. I, I, hear, your, I hear your point, you've heard mine. Okay, but. two bedroom apartments may sell better on the river than upland, so. Uh, uh, why not? Uh, 
move residential units down by eliminating the third floor parking. I think we already discussed in one of our submissions that the highest value is on the upper floors and that moving square footage down to the back on the third floor is not going to in any way uh, be equal to the value of the, the building in the tower. And it, it, whether it has river views or not. That doesn't difference. really make sense given that you you said on the fourth floor it's an $8,000 income from those apartments we, versus a $6,000 income. I think in our submission we showed that moving the floor area from the tower and moving it down below, this was in response to comments, that there was a significant loss in income. It just defies logic to think that you can take uh, space from high up in the tower building and put it down on the second, third, or fourth floor. I'm, I'm not back. looking at defying logic. I'm using your numbers. Your numbers are in the tower, a, a floor in the tower sells for six million. And the fourth floor, because it's got more floor area on it and it's got lofts and you get bigger units, sells for eight million. So that's I'll two million more. I so I don't get why you wouldn't want to. I don't know that we said it would sell for eight million. I have to go take a look at it. It might have been for the actual size of the apartment. I don't know on a dollars per square foot basis. It, it was the same. I, I will go revisit that, but it's a very big apartment and on a dollars per square foot basis it would the be. The fourth floor in the lesser variance scenarios, both of them generated 8.3 million in residential sales. Whereas, whereas you got six million in residential sales on a typical higher floor. But the floor, floor area might be different, Madam Chair. Well, you sell right, things on a dollar square foot basis. Yeah, so if you I have, have more square footage at a, at two thousand dollars a foot than I have at twenty five hundred dollars a foot. I'm still going to wind up with more absolute price. Yes, but what you're telling me is that there's basically your response tells me that the third floor is being filled up with a lot of fluff so as to have the floor area on the top whereas you're therefore your waste value your, your I, inefficiency I think in is our greater. submission we, we looked at it on a, on a dollars per square foot basis and we we, we determined that it's a down a dollars per square foot basis the square footage price for a second, third, or fourth floor apartment. It's not the same as it is in the tower. But if the size of the tower is only X big, you can only get $6 million for that X. Whereas on the third floor, it's X plus a lot, maybe well, double. In the question yesterday was, was if you remove the parking and you added that rear space to, yes. to an apartment, You'd the increase. value of that, I'll be glad to look at the value of that as compared to what the value of one of the tower apartments are. It's not a comparison. It's switch out the parking well, and put in a unit, and then you've got $8 million of income on the third floor. I don't know floor. that you have a unit $8 million there. You have That's what you said unit. about the fourth floor, $8.5 million. I'm getting 8.3. I'm getting it from your... We'll, 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 I'm just we'll saying, look at just it. one minor point. We can't, if the parking is not considered floor area, so we can't, we'd have to move floor area down there. Uh, understood. So, so, you know, we're moving floor area from one place to another. Right, but that's a $2 million... Not, no, it's a loss extra. from what you take from above. Well, let me do the no, math. No, it's two million more from what you take from above. Let me do the math and 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 see if see if you're right. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the question was raised uh, by um, Commissioner Chanda about uh, soft costs. Uh, Twenty percent is. We, we we use a line by line item basis. If you look at our Schedule B and all of our reports. We identify what the costs are for each item, itemized for soft costs, and then we add them up, and that's what the dollar value is. We don't use a percentage. We identify what the assumptions are in each of these. In the fact, I don't know a condominium development, luxury condominium that runs at much less than 40% soft costs. So 20% may be the case in terms of your experience in projects that HPD is doing, but we don't use a rule of thumb. We use a line item. Uh, identification and we identified in the light item what the assumptions are and it's the sum of those things that that gives us the soft cost it's not a percentage basis we we talk about what you can look at what the percentage is but we're not saying this is the percentage we're using as a percentage of this or that hard cost, or total hard cost. 
could we just go back to the fourth floor, third floor units? These have 16 and a half foot floor to floor heights. That probably wasn't taken into account either on your comps. That's an extremely high ceiling height. Uh, so it seems to me that should have an impact on the sales price. Uh, are you talking about, is this related to the removal of the parking or? I'm talking about even on the, you have fourth floor units, which are not being looked at as 16 and a half foot floor to floor heights. I'll, I'll revisit They're the, those. That's some of the highest. <coughs> Have mezzanines in there. I'll, I'll revisit that. Um, there were a few minor points that were a tenant fit out uh, cost was not in the proposed because the tenant fit out costs were applied to the as of right because the upper the upper commercial floors we assumed would be uh, general commercial use. In general commercial use, the owner pays for the tenant improvements for gallery space, for retail space, the tenant pays for the tenant improvements. So that's why it did not appear in the proposed. When we removed the, the, the upper floors, we also removed the, uh, the um, tenant improvement costs. Okay. Um, and that's generally uh, the, part of the reason we did that is because the floor to ceiling heights in, in the floors above the first floor were not seem to be adequate for gallery space and some other commercial use would have to be there. And uh, we assumed it would be general commercial space, in which case the owner would pay for the tenant improvements. But that's why it doesn't appear in the post. Uh, and I, I mean, I think that's the, the last point. The parking, we feel, is a benefit to the developer uh, in that he has long-term income, that anybody can use the space, enhances the value of all the spaces, and we'll try to address that a little bit more in writing. I know you're not satisfied with his business model, but uh, there are plenty of, uh, of um, parking spaces that are not rented. And in fact, in many condominium units, parking is what's negotiated. So in order to get somebody to buy the six and a half or $8 million apartment, the value of uh, half a million dollars or $400,000 for a parking space sometimes just goes out the window because the developer wants to sell the six or $8 million and he's willing to make concessions on the parking. So parking is a negotiable thing. Right, I think you should price the parking as it's a condo unit. I, I, I know you do. And know, keep so. it separate out of the apartment price so we could be clear about exactly what's being transacted. Because otherwise you're not making any case at all for the parking. I mean, it makes $90,000 a year, that's not income, but it has right? Fa well, I think and, the case but, that we've made, Madam Chair, is that the parking enhances the marketability and competitiveness of this project against projects that have no parking. And if the parking is available to possibly all of the 25 or 28 uh, purchasers, it means that the person across the street who has no parking might not capture one of those. So there's a competitive advantage to having parking on site beyond what it would be worth as a condominium. So there are two separate things. Should it be a condominium? That's a question. Should there be parking is a separate question. We believe that the parking enhances the value of the residential units right. to the developer in a competitive market. But you're not doing it any, in any quantifiable way. So how are we supposed to analyze that, right? So far, it's just a feel, feel like it. No, there, there, I, I, I don't I'll even believe that your original comps were, were apartment buildings that provided parking and at least you some certainly did, and did. Some didn't, but yeah right. so it, it was hard to get at the value that the parking is actually reflecting on the sales price because well, we, we went back and we in, the, in regards to the question of outdoor space we broke out what the value of the outdoor space was there, there's 25 units there's a small number of parking spaces and we think that having the parking spaces in the building means that uh, this developer has a has a can grab a piece of the market against those buildings that might sell an apartment for the same price but have no parking spaces. And that's all we're saying. It's a simple, simple thing. There's a competitive value added that you can't quantify. I can't say it's worth this much for this apartment or this much for that apartment. It's just a question of whether or not the developer can attract I really find it hard to believe, though, that a developer would install parking spaces in their building and then say to somebody down the block, who doesn't have parking spaces, who's selling their apartment for $2,500 a square foot, that he would say, I've taken space and I'm 
created this space which cost me and I'm going to tell people come to me for the same $2,500 a square foot because I have parking. It's more likely that he'll say come to me for $2,700 a square foot and I'll make it worth your while because there's parking here and there isn't parking there. But if I'm going to go through the trouble of constructing space for parking, I'm going to want to get some money from that any way I can. Well, I'm not going to say, so. yeah, but I'm not going to say I'm putting parking spaces here and it's not going to do anything for my sales price versus the guy two blocks away. Well, because I, I, I would put d something disagree because if there. I can sell 5% sooner, it's a which the board doesn't consider in its analysis, but debt, the carry cost of debt uh, of being able to sell out a month or two sooner is significantly better than it might be on other apartments. No, so. I think you really need to look at your comparables again. And for the comparables that have parking, Note that for the comparables that don't have parking, you need to adjust upwards for this amenity, and then you should condo the parking spaces. I, I, I hear you. Okay. okay, but even to just go back to the minimum variance subject mm -hmm. and how the burdens, whatever we decide they are, because it's at the moment not clear, it seems to me that the only real burden on the site <coughs> in terms of in terms of the zoning issues that you need waivers for, is this is this ten foot split lot condition, and and not the parking. The parking isn't a burden on the site, um, and so if we were simply to waive the ten foot split lot condition, that that then that would more than compensate for whatever kind of burdens we seem to be able to find here that have to do with the premium, which even if we accepted your number of three million or something like that of premium, would more than be compensated by allowing 10 feet on X number of floors to be residential. So the parking doesn't speak to any of that. It, 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 it's it's not, for one, you're not able to justify it. And for two, it's not working towards, it's supposed to be direct, there's supposed to be a nexus between the burden caused by the, by the site and the relief. And the parking doesn't fit there at all. Again, there's an A, B, I only deal with three of them. The A finding has to be supported by, by, by someone else. I try to help out, as right. you know. Okay. But I, I know, but you, you, you only do the findings, but I know that you work on, you work on them together. And so, so knowing that the burdens are these very specific things, and that it's really the split lot condition that's causing the problem. Oh, it's the boulders. And the, I'm no, it's, but it's the split, it's, the boulders, there's sort of, I mean, for it's one, they're not, that are required. the it's boulders, we just said, the premium is $3 million yeah. or something like that, right? So the Doesn't split lot isn't sympathy. causing a financial, isn't causing a financial difficulty. The split lot is causing a design difficulty, right? It's the boulders causing the financial yeah, difficulty. Yeah, I'm, I'm dealing primarily with the findings, and I think that Commissioner Otley Brown's question Will, will hopefully be answered to her satisfaction. No, if, well, if so, but I would like to just have you focus on if you're able to show that an as of right building doesn't work, then it seems to me that the only place that we can get to is that the, um, that the split lot condition is what's causing your problem and not the parking. It's not causing any problem. Well, we, we haven't and, said the parking is causing a problem. Yeah, you are because a you're asking for a, a parking waiver. Okay. It's not, but there's, it's not solving a problem. I don't know what the problem is that it's solving well, with the parking. I, I'd like to take the time to think about what was said and, okay. and to, to get back and, and hopefully okay. answer all of the questions and not debate okay. them. So, so there were more questions, um, some of which were showed up in the financials. That's where I, I got my questions from the financials, not from the architectural drawings, right? Okay, well, so that, the financials that was my list from it. So if you, right, so I just want, so I started to ask this question before. The financials show a lesser variance two and a lesser variance three, but for some unknown reason, there's a very slight difference in the sellable areas between these, between the two. And it's, it's, it makes no sense that there's an 84 square foot difference on one and an 8 square foot difference on the other. And then all the numbers are shifted as a result of that because you're multiplying 84 times 
your square footage sellable area, and then you add to it soft costs, and then you add and you add. The, and the so architect might be able to answer that. I'm like the, the cost estimator. Okay, the architect gives yeah, me a table. Let me just I finish my, I, I know you that that would be your answer, but the fact is you're the cost estimator, and you should be looking at what makes sense here. And it doesn't make sense that these two identical projects should have a difference in the, in the floor area. So it, it just doesn't make sense. So you might have made a phone call and said, well, we, we why, why, did, that, that why are these two things different? That we did call the architect and, and um, you know, there, it didn't make sense. But when it comes to uh, what is the square footage that, that we use, both in terms of, uh, uh, we asked the architect to provide it for the table. We checked the table to make sure the math is correct. We don't redo the zoning cap. We don't redo, we, we don't do a takeoff on, on the plans. We ask the architect to provide us with that. And okay. hopefully the architect can answer your question. Okay, about and why then the other happen. question is, so there was a cost, in the cost estimate, I know Mr. McWilkin isn't here, what's a doghouse? Okay, that's an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> that's the most, the doghouse is, is the cap on the overrun from the elevator. And it happens to look like a doghouse. Okay. All right? Okay. That's what a doghouse is. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and then the other was, uh, maybe that's an architectural question, but I'm not sure about the balconies. So maybe that's an architectural question. The, I don't, the question about why. Why they were eliminated in the version three. Um, why couldn't they have been located someplace else? Because it affects the income. Um, uh, the, the, okay. I think there may have been design decisions made about that. and. Uh, cost as well, so um, well, balconies do cost money to build. I do have a question. I, I let the architect answer that question. Are there technical or zoning reasons that's causing the balconies to be just facing east and west? Why couldn't it? Would the pro value of the property uh, be evaluated differently if the balconies were, if permitted, um, on the on the south, uh, yeah, south and north? As opposed to being I east and west. I think there were design decisions made to answer that question. But that's and a I design, just respond to the design that I get. So, uh, but you know, the balconies have to relate to interior rooms and where they are. I mean, uh, you know. Well, I think uh, if it's facing, looking at the plan, if it's facing north and south, then it's mostly uh, uh, close to the living room, as opposed to being off the bedroom. I think. I'll have to ask, ask the architect to answer that, but. So, I mean, you would still, yeah, you could still have the balcony, here the balconies are off the living room and you would, one could still have off the yeah, living it's, room. It's so, a design decision that I, yeah. I, I could put on an architect, okay. but I don't. Okay. But um, with respect to the setback waiver, again, we're getting all of this from the financials, right? That's why we keep asking you the questions. You talk about the loss of having this, um, not having the setback waiver. Um, that it represents a loss of 1.75 million because the units at the top are more valuable than the units at the bottom. And then you, I, but I, I don't understand this because you, you're, you're treating it as if this is a unique condition to this site. Well, I, I mean, it's a simple explanation is you're losing square footage, you're going to lose in, income because you can't sell square footage that isn't there. The next thing that happens is that the costs don't really change that much for the infrastructure of the building. You have to bring those elevators up, you have to have the cars and the stairways, and they're serving less area. So it becomes structurally and construction-wise inefficient. When you have setbacks, you wind up having to spend more money on waterproofing, on all kinds of stuff, drainage and things like that, where if you have a consistent building going up, uh, you're able to really homogenize the, the building uh, drainage system. So, I mean, it's bits and pieces that right. all fit together, but the significant difference is that you're losing square footage that you can't sell, and you're winding up with an inefficient floor plate and not a significant reduction in the infrastructure cost of the building. Mm -hmm. But every single building that has to follow these waivers suffers the well, same Well, but not way. everything, when you look at the, at, uh, this building is a, is a mid-block building on a, an essentially a small lot. And yes, if I had a bigger site and I had a, had a setback, 
I could perhaps absorb the setback in the configuration of buildings. I would have a bigger floor plate as the building went up. This building has a small floor plate, and, it, and it's very strapped in terms of what you can do with it. So yes, on other sites, you might be, we, we might not be here uh, with setback waivers, but on other projects that I've done and have come before the board where you have a narrow site, where you have difficulties in fleshing out the building form, a setback has a much greater impact than it does on a bigger site where you have the ability to design around that setback waiver. Here you have a tower which is structured by many factors uh, within uh, the zoning lots that are there. It's not a really big uh, floor plate and you can't absorb the setback uh, without losing revenue that, that pays some of the costs. So I think that's the, the thinking behind this. And it's not the same as a large footprint or, or a bigger site where you can design a setback to work and you can drop off elevators as they go up and you can deal with things. You need to bring the infrastructure up through the building. It's, it's both a design and, and a structural consideration and it's much simpler and you gain more sellable square footage to have uh, a uh, floor plate that's consistent without the setback waiver on a site like this. But yet on your highest floor, which is the most um, Revenue and, and mm -hmm. enhancing, you have a thousand square foot open space which you're not counting and is not selling. <coughs> I don't understand. There's a double There's height. an open yeah, to below, space. double height yeah. space. A thousand well, square when we, feet. When we take a open look, to below. When we look at other penthouses and we look at what you have to do to sell at the high level a penthouse apartment, it has to have some of those kinds of features. Well, I so think we'll, having we'll, the windows <laughs> well, and having, uh, having balconies, balconies right. at, the, at this luxury <laughs> level, okay, it's it's really well. It just what is, does. What is it, your competition? I, what is I believe it defeats your level? tower argument because right there, that's two million dollars. It makes the penthouse, and we'll we'll look at the. I mean. The, you know, the, the, the West 21st Street building, the penthouses are multiple stories. They have s private swimming pools. You, you know, there are features that you have to include in the design of a building to, to capture the luxury market. So I don't have a problem with what the architect has designed here, Commissioner Montanez. It's not uh, the same as a penthouse uh, in, in a building that would be for a different class of purchaser. For, for at this level, you're competing with, with people who are providing spectacular penthouses, and you have to provide a spectacular penthouse to sell it. I could. But we're looking the, at costs and waivers and something a bit different from making a spectacular penthouse. Well, uh, and if what, I reduced that, if I got rid of that double height, I'd have to reduce the value of the penthouse unit. I couldn't sell it for the same price. <coughs> I mean, but, sorry, but the, you, where are you putting the swimming pool if you don't have any setbacks? We're not putting in a swimming pool. The, no, but I mean if you wanted to put in a swimming pool, where do you put in your views of the river with sweeping terraces we're and not all that if you don't? We, we can't put in a swimming pool. We, have, we can put in no, a double-height space. No, you're focusing on a swimming pool, but I'm saying where are you putting the amazing penthouse terrace if you don't have any setbacks? We're pre creating a double height space. If I didn't have the but double height space in response to the terraces, that's what makes a penthouse, right? That's no, a definite, not necessarily. Right? It's, the, it's the aggregate of the features in the design of the penthouse, and that's what, what, what's being sold here. It's Unless too small, penthouses for, it's too small for, for a swimming pool, but it's big enough for a double height space. And if I didn't have the double height space, <laughs> there is a roof terrace on this. There's a roof terrace, but there is our. There aren't balconies. I mean, in a in a fabulous penthouse. I, I, I think this you is have a, a pretty triplex good, that's fabulous is, that has the, balconies on every level. I, I think this is a pretty good penthouse and a double height space. Right, but you can part get, of what makes it a But you can get a pretty great penthouse where you've got setbacks. That's a fabulous penthouse right, where you've got setbacks. But we have some costs involved. I mean, I, sure. I think we can, let, let us address in writing the question of the setbacks okay. a little bit better, okay? okay. Mm -hmm. A lot better because you're not convincing us. Okay. Uh, All right, maybe we should hear from the architect because we have some questions. Well, yeah, I'm sorry to 
sorry to say our architect was here at 11:30 and yeah. um, okay. told us she had a five o'clock meeting. We just didn't imagine, um, and she couldn't be here at, after five. So. I can answer a couple of questions, but I can't answer all of the architect questions. Uh, we'll have to um, we'll have to get her back. Um, okay. the, the one the one question that we had all talked about and I wanted to address was about the balconies um, in connection with the uh, current LD3 proposal. Obviously, we had to take the balconies off the west side because we're pushing the building over. Um, on the east side, the um, when we looked at the uh, value of those balconies. There's no river views over there, so they don't have the same value as the ones on the other side. And compare that to the costs, because there were the um, costs of including the balconies and whatever structural issues they were. It just didn't make it uh, warrant to have them on that side. So on that was why which, on the, uh, side on the on the eastern side. If you if you but have them on the western side, you have the views, and so the but cost benefit works out, but not so but much. But the original on proposal had them on the east. They had them on both, right? And it was it was that plus a um, in that there was a third factor involved, which was a design factor for having a balance to the building. Um, so they did include them, but at the end of the day, when they looked, it just didn't um, it, it didn't pencil out. Is there a reason why you're not allowed to have them on the north and south side? Um, the south side is I, I don't uh, I don't know that there's a reason I don't know I was gonna whether you can have those kind of permitted obstructions and those setbacks I don't know the answer to that we okay. can look at that I can say for the south side that there's nothing really there's no views also there's the core is in the south so that you would you would in the middle part there wouldn't be any place to put the balconies on the end where you have units maybe you could but you don't have um, you'd be looking right into um, the adjacent tower. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure it would. I'm not sure there'd be any excitement about anyone doing having those. In the north, I don't know about the permitted obstruction issue. Mm -hmm. okay. So they line up. You wouldn't be able to see the World Trade Center. I mean, one World Trade. Do we have. Um, if we have a. Do we have. Um, there's a board that we had. Remember with the site plan. I think we have. That shows the <coughs> relationship. I, I know, this is. So this is this is our building, and this is the uh, building behind. Mm -hmm. So it, you wouldn't want to put it on the south. You wouldn't want to put it on the south. Well, you'd still have views towards the west over the river from your balconies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not, <laughs> that's not so sure. Um, then they send more people here to oppose another mm -hmm. thing. Okay, so then you have other answers to the questions? That well, I have, um, we talked about the idea of the setback and why, um, you know, why at the upper floors. And it's really uh, a combination of the, as Jack said, the additional income from having it those floors versus the lower floors to make up the premium costs. It's also the um, the efficiency factor. We have right now, I think, 80% efficiency on many of those floors. We could go down to something like 76% efficiency if we um, started to have, the, where we start to have the setbacks. And the units don't lay out um, nearly as well. You also, um, the setback, we had, and this is where the architect really is important, we had put the setback uh, in the southeast corner, because it's that, you're required to have 85% of the floor below. There's nothing about where that 85% needs to be, um, which is a little odd if you think about it, because if you have the 85% in the back, there's no urban, there's no planning or architectural advantage to doing that uh, from an urbanistic perspective. Uh, but it doesn't say where it has to be. So in putting it um, there, we did it because it was um, the, you know, the, the least valuable area for us, um, but also because of the way the layouts were worked. The other thing that the architect explained to me is about where the columns of the 
uh, buildings are located on the perimeter and so when you start to set back you have to have transfers and additional costs and expenses for doing that so a combination of the income from it the efficiencies of the space um, the additional costs involved it just um, it was a very um, it, it didn't make our it didn't work for us in that perspective and the I also want to point out that the site in the C district is limited so that and you have to have a 15 foot setback and a 30 foot yard so after we do all that our floor plate is 50 by 54 which is very small um, and so then if we have to set back further then that's where all these issues come in with the efficiencies and 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 the trans and the costs at, at what height does the setback is the setback required so 40 feet is it 15 or 16? Does anyone on the team remember? It was something, it was, um, so it's 40 feet, so it was four floors, 20, I think it's either the 15th or 16th floor. It actually like, could only impact, depending upon how you arrange your floor to floor heights, it could impact only three. Mm -hmm. Right, but then we'd, wouldn't we have a less, we would have one less floor, right? If we did no, that you'd way. No, you would just have maybe higher floor to floor heights at the top. Mm -hmm. So you know, the upper 40, that 40 feet would only... But then the floors below would have to be, what, 9 or 10? I don't know what the numbers are. The floor of ceiling heights for the floors below, because you're squishing it down, right? Well, I think they're pretty liberal already, aren't they? I, I don't know. I remember. I mean, that goes to, again, if you were to fill up the third floor... I'm sorry the architect's not here, because there's a lot of it. I hope that she listens to... Um, if you were to fill up the third floor with more apartments, then you're removing some of the floor area from the tower, then you could have higher floor to floor heights, then you could maybe avoid some of the crenellation issues on the tower, and so the hardship that you're complaining of might be avoided by, by your design. So, um, and not necessarily reducing the value of the sales because you're having much more desirable units with much higher floor to floor heights. On the top floors, but not or the floors the, wherever, above. Wherever all the floor floor to floor heights are the minimum floor. of 12 feet. Right now 12 feet is right. what's yeah. being indicated right. in the drawing. <coughs> so that would go in, uh, yeah. You'd have to look at, you'd have to, everything is related, so you'd have yes. to look at that in connection with what was assumed in the comps with other apartments and their floor to ceiling heights and the like. Right. So um, I don't think we can, pull out one, one thing in isolation and say yes or no. Right, but, but we know that the comps didn't look at 12 foot floor to floor heights. They didn't mention them, right? So if that, that makes them not comps. I'm not following, and maybe yeah. this is, I'm not following how we get the same number of floors but have, but the 40 feet uh, only reflects well, three floors. Oh, I see what you're saying, but yeah, I don't know if that would work or not. Yeah, so know. anyway, so that's, I think sort of to, to cut to the first chase, you need to prove that the as of right doesn't, doesn't work. work, right? Because otherwise we're nowhere. Mm -hmm. To cut to the second, or, and prior to that, you have to make us comfortable, much more comfortable with the, with the A finding and really establish that you've got uniqueness on this site, not just a lot of burdens that add together to make it unique, right? because it's, there's got to be something physically unique about the site, right? It, because, I mean, I think that you could look at any site as being burdened by lots of annoying things. Right, I mean, there is, there is case law that talks <coughs> about the aggregate, you know, being, yes. being what's unique, and further that if you have two or three, even in some cases, four other sites that are similar to yours, you can still be right. unique. Understood. But at the moment, you haven't... We have a map that shows lots and lots of sites in a similar situation. So the engineer needs to, needs to get us closer to there being very few sites that are in this situation so that you can say you're, maybe you're not the only one, but you're one of very few, and we, we, we still don't have that. So that's part. Go ahead. If I may, so there's, there are two issues, right? There's the, the, the Douglason, right? That a site need not be individual. It can be you know, one of few, not, not alone in the universe. The other issue I think that the, the board is struggling with is um, the the aggregate hardship concept. Um, so perhaps a, so just a letter submission sort of with some case law and maybe calling through some board precedent to show where similarly uh, burdened sites have 
the board has found uh, an A finding with a similar aggregation of sites, right? That, of, of problems, rather, that um, the split lot and the subsurface conditions, and, and trying to find some instances where the board has said these, the, these do constitute. Yeah, the where case, the subsurface, for instance, isn't unique, because often the subsurface is incredibly unique. All by itself, standing alone, doesn't need to be aggregated, right? Well, but I think with the position of the applicant is that can I just add, when, when the board has seen cases with an aggregation of uniqueness, there's often been a soft site study that has literally looked at a whole bunch of other sites and said, you know, this site could be discounted because it only has three of these problems. This site is discounted because it's larger. This site is discounted. And you get, you are slowly working your way down mm -hmm. to the point where you are only one or mm -hmm. one of two, which is burdened by the same, the same group of issues that have the same yeah. deleterious effect on your site that's right. so mm -hmm. that that's soft need site. To right. do okay it. and that's trickier because you wouldn't have looked at this necessarily as a soft site with a, a building that's not being demolished right? right although it is I get forget what the percentage is 50 or 60 it's 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 fairly low percentage of the fully built out area of the site mm -hmm. it is it is a considered a soft site yeah it is considered a soft site okay. yeah we can discuss that offline as well. Okay. Okay. Um, and then, then sort of the general take is, we're having a lot of trouble with this with the numbers and the, the shifting amount of number, the shifting amounts. So be, because of the history of this application, mm -hmm. so so you shouldn't assume that we're accepting the numbers as they keep going up. I think right? I got that. I think I got okay, that. Okay, you got that. So then, understanding that the premium costs are not that high, then the scope of the waiver also is more limited. And it seems, from my perspective, and I don't know if the other commissioners agree, let's just say for argument's sake, you were able to prove the as of right didn't work. And I, I don't know if you can. Um, from my perspective, the only burden there is on this site is the split lot. I mean, the only burden imposed by zoning, in other words, is the split lot condition, and not the parking, and not the crenellation at the top. And those are, those are one-a-halves, but those are not things that have been proven in any way make this go to the minimum variance and making the project sort of make or break the project. They don't. So you should really look at this minimum variance as the minimum variance. Okay. So. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, with that said, and uh, we're going to go back, and among the things we'll do is we'll look hard at the, I think you, you said hard at the um, premium costs, because that's, that's where the uh, kick up happens. Um, looking at the uh, uh, other properties and the, the split lot condition, soft site, um, and then there's a whole bunch of other things. I don't think I necessarily right. go over those. Um, should we do a date now, or well, we need I think to you have your speakers. your um, other speakers, right? Yeah. And, and did I leave out anything that you wanted to express? No. Okay. All right, speakers, please. Uh, Douglas Woodward. I'm representing 551 West 21st and 532 West 22nd. I'm in opposition. And I think I'll reserve most of my comments because we've heard a lot today. There's been a lot to absorb, and I can respond in more detail, I think, and since the, you know, the hearing's going to be obviously kept open. Mm -hmm. um, but I do want to say that we will provide you with details on the excavation, the demolition, you know, the leaning and um, building conditions adjacent for 551 West 21st Street to help inform the decisions here. So if there's anything else you need, and, and we would like, since um, the applicant is relying on the, the three other sites in the area that Mr. Keck referred to. Um, those should, should we think, be part of the record. So we, we would actually like to see those and be able to review those as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Any other speakers? No, Robin. Hi. God, it's late. Good evening, almost. Um, <laughs> Robin Kramer from Duval and Stackenfeld on behalf of West Chelsea Partners, LLC, which is the owner of the property that you refer to as the HP property. Um, they're the tenant, the owner, not the owner. 
Um, originally, we had, I had come in at the, originally at the September hearing, I had come in and said we weren't opposed, and we were very concerned about the, the location of the building. We wanted it to be set away from our building. Um, after further consideration, my clients have determined that they are actually opposed to the variance. What they're primarily opposed to is they do not believe that the use, that there is a use issue here. Um, the finding requires that the building, the site, cannot be developed on an as-of-right basis for a use that complies with the zoning resolution. And there was a lot of discussion about the split lot condition with the assumption that on the C6 portion, you had to have residential use, and in the M portion, leaving aside the fact that we know it's not manufacturing anymore, with the M portion, you had to have something else, and they analyzed a few uses. But what they didn't do is analyze any one of the uses and use groups 5 through 12. The vast majority of uses and use groups 5 through 12 are permitted in both the C6 and the M15 district. And therefore, you could have an as of right building that was all office, that was, uh, had a lot of office, that had larger galleries. Um, in the neighborhood, we've got um, the HP building next door, which is an office building in the C6 district. On this same block, my clients are developing an office building in the M1 portion, but they're doing a high-end office building. Um, other non-residential developments in West Chelsea include 530 West 27th, and I found these by Googling, truthfully, um, uh, containing an exhibition hall and eating and drinking space, 540 West 26th Street, which is a new proposed development that will have 29,000 square feet of gallery space and 99,000 square feet of office space. Um, the Chelsea Arts Building and the Chelsea Arts Tower are both gallery buildings all of which would be permitted as of right uses could be developed on both the C6 and M15 portions. Uh, so we, that is my client's view that the use is not, there's no variance needed for the use. I do have one other comment, which is that if the board determines that the variance is appropriate, um, I note that the, our building has a fragile foundation system with poor soil conditions and a shallow water table and therefore, we are concerned about where the footings of this new enlargement would go. And we, on um, the last, uh, the lesser variance three, has the footings, I hope, eight feet away from our building. And that would be the one that would be the least disruptive to our building. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other speakers? Um, I just have a couple of responses to the last uh, person, which is just like the um, getting a list of um, uh, the listings, as Jack has said, versus the comps are very different. Listing buildings and uses and not knowing anything about those sites is a very different situation. So I don't know. The only site I do know a little bit about is the HP building, and but they have an office, but they also supplemented what they do by selling their air rights for a uh, to the next door neighbor, to the Resnick site, to the site to the south. So I don't think um, those are, are comparable or helpful um, in analyzing this particular building. Um, with the footing, of course, we've been saying all along that we want to keep our footing away from the footings away from them, and that we're very concerned about the destabilization, and we will continue to um, for that to be the case. So um, now, if we can talk about the schedule. So you tell me we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> okay. So uh, what I what I have are the dates, but I don't know the submission. It's for February 23rd continuation. What would be the... Um, ah, okay. So then you would have to submit by February 4th, 3rd. Okay. That's what we would request. Okay. You can submit that soon? Oh, actually, though, we have, a, we have opposition, opposition. counsel who, who asked for two weeks, mm. which is normal, which we normally give, and mm -hmm. then you can have time to reply, which is normally a week. So, so does that push us to the 8th, March 8th? Yeah, so if we were to do it like that, um, eighth, let's see, we would get a week. They would get is there a hearing before that? Is there one March 1st? No. No. Sorry. No. So if, if the next hearing were the 8th, then let's work backwards. You get a week, they get two, one, two, 
that doesn't work. That only gives you till January 27th to submit. So if we have, unless you don't want a, a week to reply. Okay. You don't want a week to reply or you want the I think we don't 27. want the week to reply. Okay. So March 8th and um, going backwards. And your submission February 3rd. An opposition submission February 17th for a hearing on March 8th. Okay. No reply. No reply. Okay. Okay. This concludes the public hearing for January 12th, 2016. Oh, I told you. Did you do the second one?